it's quite a tragic worldview. It says the real th truth is that there's just an abyss. Everything's miserable. Everything's cold and dark and empty and nothing means anything. So let's just try to enjoy it while we can. And that kind of sums up postmodernism. Nihilism with a smile. Hello and welcome to Popcorn Parenting, the show about movies, mythology and the messiah. My name is James Carey and I'm joined as ever by reformed mythologist Nate Morganlock. Hello, Nate. Hello, James. I'm very excited to be back for the first episode of season two of Popcorn Parenting. It is. Who thought we'd ever get here when we first Who started? Thought? But it's the second season... And where better to start than another Toy Story movie and not the cancelled Toy Story movie 4, which doesn't exist and never happened. Mm. It is Toy Story Good. 2, the movie I often refer to as the perfect movie. I'm just so excited to hear you get your opportunity to, to lay out the argument. Because I agree. I, I, I agree that it is, it is a perfect movie. But your enthusiasm, your enthusiasm is what really excites me, James. Well, let's just do the cold hard facts and then I'll explain why I think it's a perfect movie. The cold hard facts is, uh, is that back in November 1999, Toy Story 2 uh, came out. It was four years after the original Toy Story 1 and it was directed by John Lasseter and uh, the screenplay was by Andrew Stanton, uh, Rita Haseo, Doug Chamberlain and Chris Webb. Uh, based on the story by John Lasseter, Pete Doctor, Ash Brannan and Andrew Stanton. The voices of Tom Hanks and Tim Allen uh, dominate and there are also uh, some other voices as well. Joan Cusack, Kelsey Grammer, who's just fantastic in this episode. Um, and the old favourite, Wallace yeah. Shawn, um, who is also inconceivable in, uh, in The Princess Bride. We've also got uh, John Ratzenberger from Cheers, who is Ham and, uh, and various others. Uh, who we could and also Andrew Stanton as evil Emperor Zerg apparently and also the budget it cost 90 million it box office 500 million and I suspect again it's made that at least again uh, since it was released You've Got a Friend in Me uh, was uh, obviously the the hit uh, from from that uh, movie as well and also I'm just reading here that it, there was a relatively unhappy production and troubled Mm. And it just reminded me that John Lasseter would remain, it says, John Lasseter would remain fully preoccupied with A Bug's Life. And I was just thinking, oh, yes, there was A Bug's Life. And I actually re-watched that, having loved it when I saw it. I re-watched it probably yeah. a year or two ago. It's not that good. Oh. So the reason I say this is a perfect movie is it's not actually my favourite movie. Mm. I absolutely love it, but it's not in my top three. Okay. Um, but what I mean by it being a perfect movie is... With every single movie, you always just think, oh, there's that bit where it doesn't really work. Or like Spinal mm. Tap is one of my favourite movies. Yeah. This is Spinal Tap. Yeah. The last 25 minutes is not actually that good. The first hour is absolutely incredible. Yeah. But it loses its way. Yeah. Um, other, I've got other movies that I like that I really enjoy. Desert mm. Island movies I never tire of watching. One of my favourites, as a family favourite, is Bill. We've seen it eight times. Okay. Uh, which is the Horrible Histories guys made this movie about Shakespeare. But it's not. There are bits in it that I think are weak. There's mm. a couple of weak moments which bother me every time I watch it. My experience as a screenwriter myself as well. There are just a million ways of getting something wrong. I hadn't watched it with that perspective because I obviously am not a screenwriter. But it's got no fat on it. There's nothing there that yeah. doesn't need to be. Yeah. Um. So, yeah, it's very lean. It's very 92 fit. minutes. Mm. Yeah. So anyway, that's why I'm such a, a fan of the movie. Okay. Um, most people listening to this will, will have seen it. I can't quite believe that no one, that people are not yeah. seeing it. But set the scene for us with your inner world, okay. Nate. In a world where Buzz Lightyear has been fully folded in to the toys of Andy's room, the idea of brokenness and frailty and ageing comes into the toys experience. Woody's arm is torn and therefore he can't be taken to cowboy camp. And a series of events ensues to give Woody a backstory which tempts him away from Andy's room. But what I think the film is about fundamentally is summed up in Andy's mum's 
uh, response to Andy breaking Woody's arm or, or ripping yeah. some of the threads. Um, she just says, toys don't last forever. And that, I think, is the most succinct tagline for Toy Story 2. Toys don't last forever, therefore you have a crisis. All toys are in crisis because you might, like my good friend (laughs) Wheezy here, who I've got got a little Wheezy toy from a a Disney park. Um, So he's the the first one who's about to be sold in a yard sale. And um, yard sale. <laughs> so and that, but that moment of that nothing lasts forever. The bit that I'm particularly remembering is, oh yeah, he's broken, mm. and they just get that dropping. And that, see, that's interesting because Toy Story Two starts with a play sequence, just like Toy Story One did. But the like play, all correct Toy Story, all movies. correct Toy Story films must start with a play sequence, and. <laughs> It's Rex playing the Buzz Lightyear computer game and trying to defeat Zerg. He's, he's Zerg's like this end of level baddie. But then very early on, you get that initial setup with, you know, Andy's about to go off to cowboy camp and he wants to take Woody with him. And while he's playing, Woody gets his stitching ripped and Andy leaves him behind. Woody's put on the shelf. Um, literally, he's put on the yeah. shelf. And then he has a, a nightmare. He has this dream sequence in which Andy comes yeah. back, sees he's broken, and then says, Drops he's him. broken. And he descends yeah. into all these playing cards, which felt like a slightly weird... I, a I, film reference. Yeah. Probably. Is it from Big Le- There's a lot of film references in Toy Story 2. Yeah. They do the whole... Um, and he ends up Star in some Wars kind of bit. junk... He ends up in a bit of a pile of junk, doesn't he? With yeah. misshapen or misformed toys or something, yeah. doesn't he? So it, it's it's Woody's existential fear that he could be rejected by Andy, which then drives the, you know, Woody's concern to rescue our dear friend Wheezy from the yard sale when Andy's mum comes and picks them all up in a box. Now, I should just add in at this point because it, it's where it features in the in the film. If people did want to uh, use Pixar films as a as simply a, a kind of repository for sermon illustrations or quotations that you could just be taken out of context and put into kind of um, talks about Jesus, Rex has this line when all the so Rex and Slinky Dog, Ham and Buzz are looking out of the window because the yard sale's happening. And Woody has just jumped out of the window and starts running off towards the yard sale. And the toys are saying, oh, he he wants to sell himself. He's trying to, what is he doing? And then Rex says, it's not suicide. It's a rescue mission. There you go. That's Rex the, the Tyrannosaurus from Toy Story 2 gives a summary of what Jesus does when he dies on the cross. It's not suicide. It's a rescue mission. That's the line. If you only wanted Toy Story 2 for a sermon <laughs> illustration or for a short talk about Jesus, then you can use that one. You don't have to watch the rest of the film. But if you're interested in films yeah. and you care about watching them with your kids and having interesting conversations, then don't stop there. Keep watching. <laughs> They don't understand what he's trying to do at that particular moment, which, which interestingly happened previously in Toy Story 1 when Woody ends up in the removal van and gets RC and throws RC, um, yeah. the, the car, out onto the road. And they think he's trying to get rid of him as well. And so the other toys, Ham, Slinky Dog, Rex, Mr. Potato Head, have this... They, they kind of function a bit like the disciples in a way through the gospels because when you're reading through those they keep saying weird stuff and you're like what are you doing why is this happening that's a stupid idea what's what's richer so rather than um you know jesus dying on the cross to save us from our sins and that's the bit that we always look for Mm. you know we're trying to get past that and beyond that what are the other sort of bigger themes that are, are are operating in the background what we're trying to get to 
is what the film is saying on its own terms and what yeah. the concerns of the film are. And the concerns of the film are not primarily that Woody jumping out the window is, is a rescue mission. The concerns of the film are that Woody's coming to a decision about what his future is going to look like. And so because he ends up in this yard sale, he then gets spotted by Al, who is a, a Al of Al's toy barn, and then is taken because, you know, Woody's got this great value to collectors in Japan. Yeah. And it will complete the, the set for Al. So he takes him and then Woody is enters this kind of temptation, if you like. Woody is shown that he's part of Woody's Roundup and there's Jesse and there's Bullseye and there's, there's Stinky Pete and that he's a celebrity. He's got fame. He's got renown. I was on a yo-yo! It, like he, yeah. he has the, the world of and glory and splendor and fame offered to him and the, the real heart of the film is whether he will decide, well... And he's going to throw me out eventually, so I may as well just go and 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 live this life, or whether he'll he'll reject that temptation. And you know, as, as Buzz said to him, you know, you're going to spend your life stuck behind glass, you know, some life. Um, your your and then he turns back the conversation that Buzz had, uh, what he had with him in the first film. And says, you are Absolutely. not a collector's item. You are a toy. You are a toy. You're a child's plaything. You know, in terms of what does Woody think about himself? What does he see his purpose as being? You know, what is the chief end of Woody? Is it to be pristine in a box in a, in Tokyo in a museum? Or is it to be um, played with as part of Andy's imaginary worlds and, and all the excitement? So... So fundamentally, that's what the story is is about. In terms of the sequences that have been popular from the film, the cleaner. Um, I don't want to necessarily call the cleaner. It's a slightly strange title. But you know the old guy who comes in yeah. to paint Woody and, and yeah, yeah. all that sort He's of stuff? He's got one of the most... He's got that tiny pair of bellows that goes up and down. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. And all those little paintbrushes yeah. and stuff like that. Da, da, so dun, when dun, that came on... And we, wa- we were watching it yesterday and le- uh, my my daughter said, I love this bit, right? And I said, what, what, what do you love about it? And she said, well, he has all of this stuff for a toy huh like she he want he's got all these intricate little this box and all these little tools and things like that for a toy so she says i love this part but then after he's polished and sprayed the stuff and and tweaked everything you then get that terrible moment when he paints over the name andy uh. on woody's foot and and she, my daughter just went no <laughs> wow and so even though she loved it this and there's something brilliant about watching this kind of restoration project in case we know that what's the point of woody being pristine in mint condition if he's no longer andy's huh and and that i think brings in all these questions for us about you know what do we exist for what's the purpose of our lives is it to be famous is it to be rich is it to be healthy and you know and if it's just to look good but not be in relationship. I think we the testimony of every single celebrity that's ever existed yeah. is that it's not that great. Yeah. And yet it's so tempting for us and for our kids. Yeah, so that kind yeah. of bearing, you know, being the image bearer, isn't it? That is yeah. it is who who whose are you is a really strong theme there. Yeah. It's really easy to miss though, isn't it? I think one of the challenges is that the sadness of life, the kind of the, the, the existential angst, if you like, of, of the world is played out in Toy Story 2 with probably the saddest film, uh, sorry, the saddest song that you could have, which is um, When She Loved Me. Oh, my goodness. You know, Jesse sings that back. Oh, yeah. my goodness. <laughs> so she just says, you know, this story of rejection, 
You know, I was um, hers and she would take me everywhere and she'd play with me. And it's almost kind of shot for shot, like what we see in the start of Toy Story 1 with Andy playing with Woody. And this girl who plays with Jesse, Emily, I think is her name. And then one day she's sitting on the bed, the the pillow gets moved so Emily yeah. can chat with one of her friends. And Jesse falls underneath the bed and watches in the dust as this girl's bedroom changes from a, a you know young girl to now being interested in all sorts of things. And then eventually, by an accident, Jesse's found again and then and then taken and dumped at the side of the road. And <laughs> oh my goodness, that sense of being rejected yeah. for eternity, right? You're gonna end up in the trash heap. You nobody wants you anymore. You're old. You're broken. You, you're yeah. not interesting. No one cares. Yeah. Is right there in this little story. Yeah. And so... And that's what Woody's got to look forward to. Yeah. And, and, and there's this, this basic, this dilemma of, of you can either live in reality, which is that everything is decaying, everything is dying, everything will break... Children will grow old and not want to play with you. Toys end up on the trash heap. Children destroy toys and they reject them and they that's what happens. Or the alternative is live forever as a pristine museum item in Tokyo, Japan. Yeah. So they are the options. Yeah. And it's interesting that Woody's choice is to say, well... At the end of the film, I think he says, "It'll it, fun while it lasts. Mm. It doesn't really mean a thing. I am going to get rejected, but hey, I'll just enjoy myself while I can. It's quite a tragic worldview. It says the real th- truth is that there's just an abyss. Everything's miserable. Everything's cold and dark and empty and nothing means yeah, anything. Yeah. So let's just try to enjoy it while we can. And that kind of sums up postmodernism you know, nihilism with a smile. Like, that's what we want. Nothing means anything, but hey, let's just enjoy it while we can. And the truth is that that human beings aren't toys, right? We're not just these sort of things to be thrown away. Our relationship is an eternal one, and God does not grow tired of us or reject us if we break. Mm. He is actually the cleaner who restores us and sews us back together and repaints us and all this sort of stuff. But so that he can continue to be in relationship with us, so that we can enjoy him forever, you know, that the chief end of man. So um, I think that where Toy Story 2 has this incredibly brilliant angle on the the secular crisis yeah. of saying what do we do if we're honest nothing means anything you know broken brokenness and decay yeah. is just part of it yeah i mean i think though when he says, says but i'm going to enjoy it or it's fun while it lasts i don't think mm. he i think the way i think he's brushing off that's a brush off statement that i think belies a deeper truth that he knows that whatever yeah. the truth is it's not yeah being in a glass box yes i yeah. think so i think it's the rejection of that worldview and it's mm. just like i know and we as the audience know we're rooting for him we yeah. all know intellectually that jesse's warning as it were um mm. of oblivion and obscurity mm. is is the future of a toy mm. but we don't want to believe that because it ultimately yeah. it isn't true because toys are eternal because we are eternal in that movie, yeah. at least there, there are echoes of eternity that, that yeah. mean that whatever you've, you know, how, how, how you've just put it, the, the postmodernism, it sort of doesn't, we don't quite buy it and we're relieved that we don't buy it. Yeah. And I mean, it does set up Toy Story 3 very well in terms of Andy does go off to college and so the, he will make this decision about how I'm, I'm going to be played with. The brilliant irony of, the, of Toy Story fandom, 
right? So I made the mistake of, of looking at some Instagram accounts of, of sort of people who like Toy Story. Mm. So they, <laughs> it's as though they've taken Al from Al's Toy Barn as their model for how life should be lived. So they are literally buying special editions of Toy Story toys from various points within the Toy Story universe and then assembling them perfectly in mint condition around their rooms, taking photographs of them, despite the fact they're in their 40s. And you just think, I think you missed the point of this film. You're supposed to play with the toys, right? They're not supposed to be collector's items. touches on an interesting element particularly for those of us who are parents of girls which is the story of jesse so when um jesse's lying under the uh, emily's bed and she looks out and she sees emily is kneeling down with a friend of hers yeah. and they're doing nail varnish and this is like the early warning signal for She's not a little girl anymore. She's becoming a woman. And being a woman, as represented for Emily at this point, is to do with with makeup and nail varnish and this and boys. Uh, I think there's a sort of poster of a boy or something. And when I watched it the other, uh, just yesterday with my kids, I thought C.S. Lewis got quite a lot of pushback <laughs> not that anyone would have ever called it pushback back then um when he talks about what happens to susan uh, do you remember this where yeah. susan grows up and isn't interested in in narnia anymore and she's more interested in boys and, and makeup and stuff and neil gaiman interestingly ha- really charges c.s lewis with being you know sexist and and terrible on this issue which is to say that you you want to keep girls in this kind of perpetual innocence where they never actually become women and and understand the world as it really is. You're you're kind of crushing them. And I thought John Lasseter was a director of Toy Story 2. He has since been kind of, you know, exposed as having a very unhealthy attitude towards his female co-workers. And it just erased this kind of question about about girls growing up and the challenge of parenting girls as they grow up and as they face the pressures around them of, you know, of the world. And Jesse's story says that girls growing up is a bit of a problem. Right. That almost we don't know how to deal with a girl going through her adolescent years and and the challenges she's going to face. Or, Or at least that Pixar doesn't, or didn't at that stage in its writing career, you know, all written by all these guys, it, it almost didn't really know what to do, which meant that when you get to something like um, the film, which won't be named, um, we have this reaction against it with this outrageously feminist Bo Peep who's independent and doesn't need a man and doesn't need an owner and is a lost toy and that's all fine. For the benefit of our listeners, he is referring to the movie Toy Story 4, uh, but he is yes. unable to pronounce the name of that movie. <laughs> so, it, but it was, it was interesting watching it yesterday yeah. with all that stuff in mind and thinking the challenge for us as parents to guide our daughters in and through their you know their adolescence into growing up and what does that look like and and you know i know what it looks like you've got to watch tangled you, tangled you go girl. i know i know you that's go, girl. it the only this other thing we it. should we should land this uh shortly my only other thing as you were saying about it just put me in mind of when you were saying that woody was you know discovering that he's actually part of this thing that he is he is rare and special yeah. Um, and it just reminded me of the difference between movies now and movies in the past. I can't remember. I think it might have been a Nate Wilson comment I watched on an, on an interview where he says, you know, young adult fiction, particularly now, and, and kids fiction is kid discovers their Jesus. You know, yeah. Harry Potter, 
Uh, we looked at it in Frozen 2. Oh, she's one of the elemental spirits. Oh, okay. <laughs> um, rather than previously, yeah. um, although the Pevensies in The Lion, the Witch and the Wardrobe are sort of kings and queens, they're, yeah. they're not Jesus. They're not Aslan. Mm, mm, um, yeah, And so being made in the late 90s, Toy Story 2 hadn't quite got as far as uh, that. So that the idea that Woody is someone special I mean, that's, mm. that's now an awful lot of films are, you don't know who you really are. You're special. And that's a yeah, good yeah, thing. Yeah. yeah. Whereas with this, it's just like, you're special. Ooh, that's rather a sterile kind of thing. And it's... Yeah. Not... And, th- and that's why I love the Toy Story yeah. trilogy so much. Because it, it holds on to the relational, essential nature of human beings we're supposed to be in relationship not only with one another but with our creator and life outside of that is going to be horrible and it's going to be horrible whether you end up in a in a a landfill or you end up in a museum the the sterility of life in the museum is is horrible and the you know the decay and abandonment and suffering there and the question then is, so how do we have this forever friendship with our creator? Yeah. And and that is the offer, isn't it? That is what is offered. And that is what is offered. And that, I suppose, if you went back to um, Rex's comments about the yard sale, it's not suicide, it's a rescue mission. That's where we revisit the gospel. Oh, we look back again at what Jesus has done because this is how we are going to be. We're, we are going to live forever in relationship with our creator, not that we can just put up with it for a while and then everything's meaningless or just pretend everything's going to be okay. So it, it's it's such a brilliant, a, a brilliantly simple construction yeah. of toy and child that helps us as parents think through, you know, creator and creatures and that relationship. So a question, so a question you could ask is to your, to your kids after you've said, what was your favorite bit? Why did you like it? Yeah. What, what bit yeah, yeah. you sad is who do you belong to? You know, yes. do you feel like you belong to Jesus? Like, yeah. you know, and especially uh, with Jesse, you know, in a way, Jess, Jesse is the one who finds a home. And exactly, and that's what's brilliant. He's Woody does this evangelism. Yeah, Woody basically says, "I know Andy is so good and such a good owner and such a good child that he will welcome you in." And again, you know, not to get too cross about Toy Story Four. Toy Story Four is a failure to evangelize. Hmm. Woody tries to encourage other toys to come and join him and the gang. Um, and they that's rejected because no, no form of, of relationship with a divine being or a, a child at that point is worthwhile. The only thing you can do is be out on your own. So, so sorry, I've sort of slightly sidetracked there. W- Jesse has Andy's name written on her book by the end of the film. Bullseye has Andy's name written on his four shoot mm. and it says Danny <laughs> at one point and then he rearranges yeah. it. So they're brought into the fold, brought into this relationship. So who who do you belong to? Whose name would be written on your boot is a, is a great question to ask. I think the other one to ask is if you're broken like Woody was broken or Wheezy <laughs> was broken, um, will God still accept you? Hmm. and you know if you want a bible verse on that you know you'd say the bruised reed he does not break the smoking flax he does not quench so jesus says i've not come to call the healthy but the sick um so so that for us to think we have a god who accepts us in our brokenness and in our sort of Hmm. um decayed state our sinfulness jesus with a samaritan woman he kind of knows, yes. he knows exactly what, you know, go and get your husband. Oh, I don't have, uh, yes. Yeah. Yeah. I, mm. I know what you've done. And you know what, you know, you, you're, you're, you're in. Just been looking at Joshua a lot recently and just, you know, the story of Rahab is the same, isn't it? It's totally, know, yeah. And there she is in the family tree. 
uh, completely, completely in. Well, that's Toy Story 2, um, the best Toy Story movie, in my opinion, and the best, possibly one of the best movies of all time. Uh, for reasons oh, we've suggested lots to talk about I hope that's been helpful again it doesn't matter whether you land this in a moment or not it's an ongoing conversation you have with your kids that's going to last for for years so don't feel you have to do it all you've only got one shot you've got you've got road trips movies you'll watch it again different conversations the kids will change yeah. times will change and you can go back and go back again this is no time to panic exactly this is the perfect time to panic <laughs> so great well um thanks very much nate thank you james and thanks very much for listening and we'll speak to you next time cheerio bye bye come back woody we love you isn't it <laughs> yeah, i think it's in that it. yeah